So when does it all matter? Why is entrepreneurial strategy different from corporate strategy? You may have already learned about strategic management in other courses, but what makes entrepreneurial strategy special? To give you an introduction to this, here's Joshua Gans, myself, at a TED Talk a few years ago. Everybody here is here because they're interested in ideas. And I'm sure most of you, all of you, have actually had an idea. Uh, (laughs) That wasn't supposed to be a joke. (laughs) I'll get to that in a second when we talk about my ideas. Uh, so so, So you have an idea. You actually think it's going to solve a significant problem. You think it is an idea that uh, perhaps you could even make, even push along. Uh, You think it's an idea that could be successful, make you successful, and maybe even wealthy. But soon after thinking of these ideas, it it occurs to you that there are fear sets in. Uh, There are all sorts of challenges. Can you really do it? Do you really have the resources that are going to push that idea forward? is it, is it something that somebody else has already thought of before and is already doing? These are things that stand in the way of getting your idea out there, and a lot of those things are quite legitimate ones. Now, a few years ago, and this is where we come to talk about my idea, uh, I should warn you, it's not going to be one of these ideas that is of TED significance of some of the ones we've already heard today. Uh, but I will claim it to be of widespread significance, as you'll see in a second. Uh, my aha moment uh, came when I saw Steve Jobs in 2008 on, on a web video uh, introduce what was to become the App Store uh, for the iPhone. They were going to introduce an iPhone with applications on it, and the iPhone was going to have GPS. And I thought to myself, this thing's going to have GPS and an internet connection, What would I want to see on that iPhone? What I'd want to see is this. What this is, is a search for the nearest restroom. That's what I wanted. That was the first thing that popped to my mind. and I thought this was a fairly uh, uh, clear idea. It's a want that was very well defined. And maybe it was the sort of idea uh, that I could push forward. Uh, and so that's what I thought about doing. Now, unlike the guy in this Onion Talks video, <laughs> who came up with an idea and then said, Ted audience and the rest of the world, you can now do it, I've done the hard work, uh, I thought maybe I could actually, um, in contrast to my usual reputation as a professor, actually see if I could push something forward in the economy. Uh, and I gathered uh, MBA students together. Uh, it wasn't very hard to sell them on this. I wasn't uh, someone who could do any coding or anything like that, but I could gather those resources together and we could push ahead with this idea. Now, as we came to explore it, the first problem that presented itself was, where are the public toilets? Where are they? I mean, you know from your things, but how would you get the data for an app to locate accurately uh, public toilets. Well, as it turned out, we had a gift. A few years earlier, I was in Australia, and which is where I I was from, except for uh, coming here these last two years. They had a government program called the National Continence Management Strategy. And one of the recommendations of the National Continence Management Strategy was to set up the National Public Toilet Map. (laughs) And here it is. What you do is, this is the, you go to this web page and you enter the address you want to go into. You put in what sort of toilet you're after. Look at any characteristic you could think of. (laughs) And when you pressed Click on that, voila, you had a a map of the toilets where you wanted to go. Now, that's where the data was. 
the data had already been collected. Uh, now, the problem with this, of course, this was pre-smartphones, though it occurred to it. You could actually call up this on a uh, iPhone at the time, and it would turn up, because it was rendered that way, into a little screen you could never really uh, look at. It was, it was, uh, it was Im almost impossible to use, and also you had to enter the address. So you had to know where you were to find the nearest toilet, which was not quite the vision for relief I had in mind. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, because the data was there, uh, we contacted uh, the National Continents Management Strategy and asked whether we could license the data to build this app. I had I had some visions on how we were going to be able to fund that. I thought I'd written a book on parenting. I would, might be able to uh, put the two things together somehow. Didn't really matter. But we inquired, uh, and I don't want to go into the, uh, cut a long story short, is basically they said no, which is a whole story in of itself. They were refused to give us the data for this. Now, being uh, that pretty much was the end of it for us because we had no other way. I'm an economist, not a cartographer. We weren't going to find the, uh, the, the data anywhere. Um, so we gave up on that idea, let it go to rest. Somebody else would do this. Uh, and I did what I could do, uh, being an academic. I wrote a, an opinion piece about this. <laughs> and I complained that the government wasn't telling us where the toilets were. <laughs> and what are you going to do? They are left with this strategy that currently envisaged somebody with continence issues, worried about where they're going to head out and planning their day so that they have lexa anxiety, surely we could do better. And surely we, this is not just a toilet problem, but a problem with lots of data. And government data should be put out there so that people could freely build apps and take into account this new uh, burgeoning industry. Now, took two years, the Australian government did do that. Uh, they held a review <laughs> because of my opinion piece, toilets were front and centre. Uh, and the national public toilet map was released and it was put out there and we were, we were successful in that. Australia is the only place, though, you can find an accurate toilet map. I, I should just say, and, and it's not because this is an unobvious idea. Everybody's had this idea. Larry David <laughs> devoted almost an entire season of Curb Your Enthusiasm to someone having this idea. Well, it was more than a great idea. An iPhone application that leads you via your GPS to the nearest acceptable toilet wherever you are in the world. <laughs> the eye toilet. And I thought of it. <laughs> oh. That was one killer app. Why'd you have to give it all to that crook made off? I don't know. And bringing it to market. So it's not like it was great and uh, it's not rocket science, that's for sure. There was an app called Sit or Squat that was launched very soon after in the United States. It's not the most appealing name, but it accurately collected what that app was trying to do, which was not only find out where the toilets were, but also allow consumers to rate them, including with pictures. <laughs> Again, you can't fault them for usefulness. Um, but the problem with that, of course, was it wasn't... Uh, totally accurate, because they didn't have, they had some idea where the toilets were, but it wasn't very accurate. And when you need to pee, you're not worried about Apple Maps finding you the nearest Starbucks. When you need to pee, you have to have an accurate map. It has to know exactly where those toilets are and if they're open. You don't have second chances. So, <laughs> so they sold this app, and, uh, but there were other things, so it didn't really work. Um, another uh, attempt was Clue. That actually I don't think ever came to market. It was the idea of, well, uh, I'm not making this up, an Airbnb for toilets, which is basically that you'd tap into social networks and you'd know your friends and your friends of friends and you'd all make your toilets available in case someone in the city of Toronto needed to go. <laughs> it was the social toilet map. Um, <laughs> however, uh, that didn't come to pass for obvious reasons. Um, but this was the same idea, trying to get it out there. In the end, uh, Sid or Squat was actually acquired by Charmin. <laughs> and Charmin took away the pictures. They didn't take away the name, surprisingly. Um, but, they, uh, but, but still, the, if you look on the App Store, the, the problems of this app remain. There hasn't been much development in it. And in fact, you can't go anywhere but Australia and find an accurate toilet application, despite how obvious this idea is.
And that's because the business model that's going to fund the accurate map to do this it hasn't yet been found. Now, if I had to guess who would be willing to invest that money, it would be the map makers themselves. But if you go to Google Maps and put in public toilets for this location here, that's where you get Canon Tor Toronto. I don't know why. <laughs> and, and if you look there, it's, it's a 36-minute drive away. <laughs> And I, I'm not confident that we'll, you'll get to Canon and, and you'll, find, you'll find a bathroom. If you put it into Siri, ask where the nearest public toilet is, no, not there. There's no, there are no, I couldn't find any public toilet. Because that data isn't part of those maps, isn't part of those maps. So they haven't done it. This clear pressing, and I said widespread but not significant need, uh, hasn't been satisfied yet because no one's found the business model to fund what the public infrastructure could do. All right, so I'll put that out there with the hope of spurring development here. When you want to think about why entrepreneurial strategy, we need to center on the paradox of entrepreneurship. Recall that that was the situation where entrepreneurs faced a trade-off between the value they could create and the value they could capture because to create value, they had to cede some control, which was the same thing that would undermine their ability to capture value. When it comes down to it, there are four conditions that are special to the entrepreneurial environment, or pretty special at that, which give rise to the paradox of entrepreneurship. And then, once you recognize the paradox of entrepreneurship, there are three principles of entrepreneurial strategy that can be applied to get and to make progress here. So let's look at those four axioms first. Axiom one is freedom. This axiom says there is more than one path to create and capture value from an idea. Let's illustrate this with the TED talk and the conclusion of it. Uh, but let me discuss something that has been perhaps more successful in finding a business model. And that is Instagram. Instagram had a core idea. It was, again on mobile devices, to allow you to take a picture easily uh, and take a good picture easily and then obviously share it as well. It was one of the things in mobile devices coming up. Actually getting people to take good pictures was a hard thing and filters were a great leveler for that. They weren't the first with that idea. Hipstamatic, among others, had a similar idea. Now Hipstamatic preceded Instagram to the App Store by a number of months. Now Hipstamatic, was a paid app. It cost $4.99 effectively, and it was a huge success. It sold millions of copies of that. Um, it wasn't quite as friendly to use as Instagram turned out to be, but it was basically the same idea, how to take better pictures on an iPhone for, for ordinary people to do so. You had the same idea, and you had these two firms produce very different business models. Hipstamatic paid, let's just sell it as a normal thing, Instagram, actually I don't know what their business model was, but they were giving it away for free. Okay, And if you asked anybody in 2010 to say, who's going to make the most money out of this, it was not clear at all. Now, fast forward to today, and it's very, very clear. There's not even just a little bit of difference between these two. There's a huge amount of difference. Instagram is now the poster child for successful apps with three quarters of a billion dollars because the business model it found was, turns out when you take pictures, you want to share them, and where do you do the most sharing? On Facebook. And so Facebook acquires Instagram. Why it paid that much is still partially a mystery, but nonetheless, you can't argue that it was an alternative business model and probably the right one for that idea. So step one in thinking about entrepreneurship, and if you have an entrepreneurial idea, is to recognize that you have a choice. The idea is different from the business model that would take it to market. Okay, Time and time again, you see ideas presented with their business model. I've seen Netflix for batteries, which is basically you subscribe to recycle batteries. That's combining an idea, recycle batteries and getting them easily to people, with a particular sort of business model, and it's wedding you to that. Because the business model really matters as to whether an idea gets out there, you can't just rely on that. So you have to recognize you have a choice. 
Let me give you just another example closer to home in the University of Toronto here. Blackboard is the learning management system of the University of Toronto. You probably, most of you who are students have used it here, and you probably love it as much as professors do. <laughs> it was developed many, many years ago. Web technologies involved, things have evolved since then, and undergraduates like yourselves, like many of you here, had the idea that, you know, why are we organizing uh, course management like portals, like like syllabus sheets or something like that. Surely the main thing we want in our course uh, management system and front and center is the activity stream, the thing that allows students to interact with each other and professors. And students were in fact inventing this already on Facebook themselves. They were keeping the professors out because they didn't want to see what they were doing. But nonetheless, they were doing it. So one group of ward and undergraduates uh, founded what came to be known as Law, which is a very, very social network type learning management system, dead easy to use. Very easy for professors to know what to do with it. You don't need a day of training. Believe it or not, you do need that for Blackboard. You don't need this for this. And it was all centered around the activity stream with all the other course materials feeding into it. They had the idea that they were going to give that away. There was going to be a free thing and they'd work out how to make money off it later on. At the same time, two University of Toronto Computer science students who have graduated now, Hardy and Marwan Aladdin, uh, they're actually serial entrepreneurs. They've been entrepreneurs since they were 11. Uh, and they've had, this is like their third venture or something, founded CoursePeer. Again, the same idea to center a learning management system around the activity stream, the news feed that was coming in. Well, basically, CoursePeer opted for a different strategy. They recognized that all the information generated from that feed were telling something about students' collaboration, their uh, softer skills, if you will, and employers would be interested in that. University of Toronto Engineering uh, School has been extremely interested in that and has been rolling this out. But CourseFear was able to experiment because it was looking to actually sell this thing and has now found that corporate education is very, very interested in this. And those experiments are continuing. So step two is to, to experiment with alternative business models and allow yourself to do that. Which of course leads to step three, is that as experiments aren't free. Experimenting isn't free. If you sell something for free because you want to disrupt something, it's very hard to raise price later on. There might be a good model, business model for some circumstances, as Instagram has shown, but you can't just raise price later on. It isn't free. If you want to, uh, if you want to uh, make a big bang, a big splash is your business model, you've got a problem is you might attract attention from competitors. So that wouldn't be free. If you want to include a lot of people in your business plan, you risk losing control of the idea. It might not be free then. So to give you one final example of those costs, this Kira Talent is a venture that came out of the Next36 program here in Canada that I have a, a bit of involvement with. That selects the 36 top undergraduates who are interested in entrepreneurship every year and literally puts them into ventures and funds them and teaches them some economics and business along the way to see them come to successful. Kira Talent was one of the ones from last year and what they had the idea of was changing how we recruit uh, uh, people for employment, ha so replacing face-to-face -face interviews with a video interview. An employer sends a set of questions to you, you sit in front of a webcam, you answer those questions, shoot it back to them, you don't have to come in, it saves them time, it saves you time, it's a better screening device. Now their initial idea was they're going to get the people who are being hired to pay for services that will make the web videos look prettier. Okay? Well it turned out people didn't want to pay for that, so they switched their business model towards charging the recruiters. But how do they find their customers? Well, one of them, they made the interesting uh, decision of asking me what I thought. How in my business would I, you know, use this? And I was thinking, oh, what are you, crazy? I, this is some stock standard undergraduate question. Why are you here asking me, a professor, how this would work in my business? I'm not in a business. All we ever do is get students into the program and we have to think about who's the best students to... to, to, to. I did wrong. Maybe we could use this to recruit and to interview MBA students, not just for recruit. And that, Rotman became uh, Kira's first customer, uh, and now they've been rolling out with business schools uh, to help in those recruiting process, which of course advertises to other firms as well. 
And that's through experimenting in different ways and recognizing that you can change your business model by keeping your core idea. So there are one idea has many business models. You have to recognize you have to you have a choice. You have to experiment with different business models and you have to pay attention that that experimenting isn't free. So it's something you have to prioritize and think about. It's costly, but that's what makes it valuable. Axiom two, we call constraint. Constraints prevent the pursuit of more than one alternative at one time. In other words, there may be many value, but many paths that an entrepreneur could take to commercialize an idea, but they can't pursue all of those paths at the same time. This is not necessarily a constraint that faces larger established firms who have more resources and who have more, for want of a term, a window to uh, implement their strategy. The third axiom is uncertainty. Here's how that's stated. The probability that an idea is valuable is not known to the entrepreneur. Moreover, it cannot be evaluated without some commitment. In other words, you can do as much investigation as you want without touching the market, without going widespread in your ideas. But in order to understand the true value of an idea, you actually have to do something. And invariably, doing that thing cuts off avenues that you might otherwise have pursued. That's why we call it commitment. These three axioms together mean that learning about choices along a certain path requires some commitment. You're going to have to do something to move forward. But axiom number four puts it all together. Choosing to move along one path changes the conditions for moving along other paths. In other words, there's a certain amount of irreversibility. Once you start to do something as an entrepreneur, you start to, I guess for want of a better term, change the world. But that means you can't reset, you can't go back, you can't run a separate and independent experiment. Sequencing is going to matter. This is perhaps illustrated by the case of Bob Kearns that we'll revisit in a future lecture. But to give a very short version of it, Bob Kearns invented the intermittent windshield wiper. You can't build your own car, so you have to sell it to an automaker. He tried to sell it to Ford. He did this by showing him that his invention, which Ford actually ended up passing on and then making it themselves without paying Kearns. In other words, Kearns, by approaching Ford and disclosing the invention, cut off his other opportunities to be able to sell either to other car makers or to do something himself, something that would not have occurred had he not made those disclosures. That's the trade-off between creating value and capturing value that we've been talking about all along. In effect, these four axioms mean that there is a paradox of entrepreneurship. All these things together need to be present. If any one of them changes, there isn't that same sort of dilemma and trade-off that we see there. What is that paradox of entrepreneurship? That is, choosing between equally viable alternative strategic commitments requires knowledge that can only be gained through experimentation and learning. Yet, the process of learning and experimentation inevitably results, at least in some level of commitment, that foreclose particular strategic options. Entrepreneurial strategy's job is to resolve the paradox of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurial strategy is the sequence of choices a founder makes to test specific value creation and capture hypotheses when entrepreneurial experimentation requires partial commitment. In other words, you have to choose what to do first, because what to choose first changes returns to other choices, and so you have to get the sequencing right. This means that choosing among equally viable options is going to be something that you are going to face, 
and you'll want to think about the strategic consequences of that. Next up, what are the principles that we can derive from this? When you want to think about why entrepreneurial strategy, we need to center on the paradox of entrepreneurship. Recall that that was the situation where entrepreneurs faced a trade-off between the value they could create and the value they could capture because to create value they had to cede some control, which was the same thing that would undermine their ability to capture value. When it comes down to it, there are four conditions that are special to the entrepreneurial environment, or pretty special at that, which give rise to the paradox of entrepreneurship. And then, once you recognize the paradox of entrepreneurship, there are three principles of entrepreneurial strategy that can be applied to get and to make progress here. So let's look at those four axioms first. The first axiom we call freedom. That's the idea there is more than one path to create and capture value from an idea. This is what was already recounted in uh, the TED talk. Pause, cut, blah, blah. Axiom one is freedom. This axiom says there is more than one path to create and capture value from an idea. Let's illustrate this with the TED Talk and the conclusion of it. Discuss something that has been had. Axiom two, we call constraint. Constraints prevent the pursuit of more than one alternative at one time. In other words, there may be many value, but many paths that an entrepreneur could take to commercialize an idea, but they can't pursue all of those paths at the same time. This is not necessarily a constraint that faces larger established firms who have more resources and who have more, for want of a term, a window to uh, implement their strategy. The third axiom is uncertainty. Here's how that's stated. The probability that an idea is valuable is not known to the entrepreneur. Moreover, it cannot be evaluated without some commitment. In other words, you can do as much investigation as you want without touching the market, without going widespread in your ideas. But in order to understand the true value of an idea, you actually have to do something. And invariably, doing that thing cuts off avenues that you might otherwise have pursued. That's why we call it commitment. These three axioms together mean that learning about choices along a certain path requires some commitment. You're going to have to do something to move forward. But axiom number four puts it all together. Choosing to move along one path changes the conditions for moving along other paths. In other words, there's a certain amount of irreversibility. Once you start to do something as an entrepreneur, you start to, I guess for want of a better term, change the world. But that means you can't reset, you can't go back, you can't run a separate and independent experiment. Sequencing is going to matter. This is perhaps illustrated by the case of Bob Kearns that we'll revisit in a future lecture. But to give a very short version of it, Bob Kearns invented the intermittent windshield wiper. You can't build your own car, so you have to sell it to an automaker. He tried to sell it to Ford. He did this by showing him that his invention, which Ford actually ended up passing on and then making it themselves without paying Kearns. In other words, 
Kearns, by approaching Bo- Ford and disclosing the invention, cut off his other opportunities to be able to sell either to other car makers or to do something himself, something that would not have occurred had he not made those disclosures. That's the trade-off between creating value and capturing value that we've been talking about all along. In effect, these four axioms mean that there is a paradox of entrepreneurship. All these things together need to be present. If any one of them changes, there isn't that same sort of dilemma and trade-off that we see there. What is that paradox of entrepreneurship? That is, choosing between equally viable alternative strategic commitments requires knowledge that can only be gained through experimentation and learning. Yet, the process of learning and experimentation inevitably results, at least in some level of commitment, that foreclose particular strategic options. Entrepreneurial strategy's job is to resolve the paradox of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurial strategy is the sequence of choices a founder makes to test specific value creation and capture hypotheses when entrepreneurial experimentation requires partial commitment. In other words, you have to choose what to do first because what to choose first changes returns to other choices. And so you have to get the sequencing right. This means that choosing among equally viable options is going to be something that you are going to face. And you'll want to think about the strategic consequences of that. The four axioms of entrepreneurial strategy lead to the paradox of entrepreneurship, which in turn gives rise to three principles of entrepreneurial strategy that we can look at to guide how we deal with this sort of environment. Those three principles are fairly easy to state. First, choice matters. There is a link between choice and commitment. Choice without commitment means you can go back and choose whatever you want and do a do-over without any consequences. Choice with commitment means there's a whole lot of one-way doors. Go through one, there may be no going back. Second principle is these choices matter. I'm going to show you the four key choices, choose your competition, customers, technology, and identity, are the key choices that you should think about when formulating an overall entrepreneurial strategy. And then finally, these choices matter together. There are certain constellations of choices that make sense, and they form four overall classes of strategy. It's not the be-all and end-all, but it's a great guide to how to formulate an entrepreneurial strategy. And we'll be dealing with that too in a later lecture. Principle number one first, choice matters. What this means is this is our hybrid between taking action and planning. Basically, you do a bit of planning, then you get to a set of two or more options that are very hard to evaluate, so you're just going to have to do one. So the way we often think about uh, implementing an entrepreneurial strategy is we have a core idea, and then we use that to choose a strategy. And basically, we ask ourselves, is it going to cost more to do this than the benefits we expect, or not? And that's why we go ahead with. Some versions of this, however, take a more staged approach, where you begin with an idea you do a little bit of experimentation, you hone the idea in, and then you choose your strategy. Think of this as a bit of de-risking. Dip your toe in the water, see what's going on, and then if things look good, you continue after that. It's the sort of thing that makes sense. Where that gets complicated is where there are more than one option. Remember, that's what gave rise to choice mattering. Where there's more than one option, you can dip your toe in the water, but that may actually cause you to be able to uh, be unable to go through some paths. So if you dipped your toe in the water to test out the blue strategy and then decided it was wanting, you can't simply go and do the red strategy. 
Put simply, learning about blue can potentially make red unviable, and vice versa. We could have seen this in Peapod and Webvan. It was very hard for Webvan to uh, pursue a strategy which talked about undermining and destroying traditional supermarkets, and then when it didn't work, get up and say, oh, we'll cooperate with them instead. Similarly, it might have been hard for Peapod, once it had tied itself to traditional supermarkets, to reverse course and do what Webvan did and come and compete with them. Now, sometimes these changes are possible, sometimes they're not. That's not the issue. The issue is, is it going to be more costly to pursue one strategy after you've tried and failed with the other one? More often than not, it is. And for that reason, the strategy you choose and the path you choose really, really matters. There aren't any clear do-overs. What does this mean? It means that when learning about a strategic option makes it more difficult to learn about an alternative, the choice of strategic direction determines the future scope of the venture. You don't want to simply assume that strategic implementation of an idea reflects the environment. Being choice-based means that there is a choice and you have to choose effectively your environment. Any little dipping of your toe in the water could potentially change the world and change for you the options available. So you have to think about what goes first, where to start, and how that will impact on what you can do afterwards. Because in none of this stuff is it guaranteed. In none of this stuff is it certain you will succeed. Principle number two are these choices matter. What we're going to do is pause now and have a look at an important case, an interesting case, that will help us frame our discussion of this for these introductory purposes.